Good morning, everybody. My name is David Andalfaro. I'm a Vice President in the Research Division at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Uh, I'm very happy to have Andy Atkinson here, who's a Professor of Economics at the University of California of Los Angeles. Uh, Andy will be presenting a paper today at the uh, Policy Conference, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis 38th Annual Policy Conference. The paper is called Measuring the Financial Soundness of U.S. Firms from 1926 to 2012. Uh, Andy, I was wondering if you could please tell our audience, first of all, uh, you know, describe kind of the, the question or the set of questions you're asking in the paper and what your findings are. And perhaps you might start even by uh, defining for us what you mean by financial soundness. Well, thanks for having me here. And I look forward to having uh, a, a full 50 minutes to present the paper. But <laughs> to give a quick summary, um, the first thing we're trying to do is to uh, uh, I mean, clearly in this last financial crisis, uh, I would say many firms looked like they were financially distressed. And so what we're trying to do is, can we systematically measure the level of financial distress that firms are facing, and then go back through history and ask questions like, uh, uh, how, how many times has this happened in the past? And the, the comparison we find most interesting is between 2008 and the Great Depression. There's a lot of theories about the importance of financial distress and business cycles and macroeconomic fluctuations, in, in not only in the Great Depression in 2008, but in other post-war recessions. And we hope to make a contribution to measurement to kind of see how important this factor might have been. So we have to first start with, as you asked, how do we define financial soundness? So we're taking a perspective uh, that is rooted in 30-year-old uh, models of the credit risk that firms uh, present to a creditor. And so if you're lending to a firm and you're thinking about the credit risk it presents, uh, according to the kind of standard models in corporate finance, you think about two main features of the firm. The leverage it already has, and then what's the risk in the, in the uh, firm's underlying line of business, in the assets that it has. And uh, if you're evaluating credit risk, you'll be inclined to say, a firm that has a relatively safe line of business can safely sustain a high level of leverage. A firm that has a very risky line of business, uh, you can't lend it very much uh, uh, for fear it will uh, default soon. And so um, what we're looking to measure firm by firm for every publicly traded firm in the United States over this time period is, can we measure their leverage adjusted for the degree of business risk? And uh, we argue this is something that's done. Moody's Analytics does it. They have a product they sell called uh, uh, expected default frequency. Uh, the academic literature does this. But they do it typically with a combination of a sophisticated model and uh, they use a lot of accounting data. We're trying to find a shortcut so we can go all the way back to the Great Depression where you don't have accounting data and maybe you're not so sure of your sophisticated model. So our primary innovation is to say that you can actually do this by looking at the equity volatility of a firm. And so once we take that step, we can use this statistic that we use the inverse of a firm's equity volatility and compute that every month for all the publicly traded firms in the United States and go monthly back to 1926 and say, what is the cross-section distribution of leverage adjusted for asset volatility look like over this whole time period? So that's really the goal of, of the paper. And then the main findings that we have, uh, I would say, are, are really th three. Um, one is, uh, there are three what we call distinctive crises in this time period in U.S. history that are roughly the same magnitude. The Great Depression, 32-33, again in the fall of 1937, which is the second main recession in the Depression, and then 2008. Hmm. So when Ben Bernanke says that his impression was uh, that the economy you know, was as bad, the financial crisis of 2008 was as bad as the Great Depression. W we are finding that. Uh, we're finding also, though, that this really is not that big a factor 
in the other post-war U.S. business cycles. It's not nearly as big as what happens in these three episodes. So our first finding is, you know, something very distinctive is happening in what we would call these kind of financial, cr financial crisis-driven recessions. Um, the second main finding has to do with, okay, what's the main driver of these movements in firms' financial soundness? The standard stories that macroeconomists and many people tell have to do with um, uh, a combination of an advance of the crisis, firms, creditors get lax, people build up leverage, then uh, uh, something happens, so asset values fall, housing values fall, the stock market falls. And because of the fall in the stock market or house values, or you know, the values of underlying businesses, firms all of a sudden look very levered. That's the standard story. And then we're in this uh, uh, situation where the firms look financially very fragile because they borrowed, they raised their borrowing in advance of, you know, say some asset boom occurs and then the asset prices go down and, and now they're in trouble. We're not finding that that's what happened in the Depression or in 2008. Hmm. The, the, the main thing that we're finding, at least is what the stock market appears to be perceiving, is that the risk of the underlying businesses dramatically increased. And ways that we see this is that um, when you, you know, in, in 2008, we have accounting measures of firms' leverage. So we can see how much that moved and we can see Although, obviously, the S&P 500 fell a lot, it didn't move nearly as much as the underlying, the, what you're reading from equity volatility going up as a measure of the underlying risk, the risk in firms' underlying businesses. Uh, the other way we can see it is, even if you look at firms that didn't have any long-term debt, they also look like they're getting in financial distress. And you might ask, how can a firm that doesn't have debt get in distress? But if you think about it, I, I like to use the example of BlackBerry, RIM, mm -hmm. right now. Uh, if you look at RIM's income statements, they have a lot of fixed costs. They have very high sales and uh, general operating expenses, very high R&D budget. So the way that they're losing money is that they've got this fixed cost that acts economically as if they had leverage. And so we call that operating leverage. So, mm. you know, firms have operating leverage, firms have financial leverage. They get to get in distress either way when the risk of their underlying business goes up. So those are the, um, I mean, you had asked me before the camera was rolling, rolling about how this related to some theories about uh, leverage cycles. Uh, you know, those are operating. We get a figure in the recent crisis, changes in leverage account for about 20% of the deterioration in the distribution across firms of their financial soundness. But the majority of the move, about 80% of the move is due to, we find is due to changes in underlying That's business That's very risk. interesting. But what, what do you think then accounts for the popularity of the view of this leverage cycle? I mean, is it just the, the fact that there's such prominent examples like Lehman's uh, that were the, the center of the storm in the crisis that kind of, uh, uh, distort uh, uh, the reality of what, what is actually going on? Um, well, I mean, I think that, uh, uh, one, we can measure leverage, and certainly uh, to anyone who studies the history of financial crises, you know, uh, you can go back hundreds of years and see leverage, you know, what looked like leverage cycles, mm -hmm. of, you know, lending to speculators in a boom and then things going bad in a bust. And so I don't want to diminish right. uh, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that those are there, but what I want to stress is our main finding is that the underlying perception of risk in the, in the market it, it is rising by much more than what you get from the change in leverage. I think I interrupted you. You said you had three key findings that you just uh, Well, so the third, the third one is probably the most controversial. Yeah. Um, one thing we can do with our method is we can say, okay, what was going on with the financial soundness of financial firms, particularly big banks, and what was going on with the financial soundness of uh, uh, non-financial firms, and we can compare them. And 
uh, one thing we expected to find, and one thing that's certainly talked about a great deal, is that uh, as the, in the U.S. we went through a period of deregulation, you know, going back to the 80s, of financial firms, um, this allowed these firms to take on more leverage relative to the risks that they were taking and that this process accelerated with deregulation in the late 1990s and you know the story a lot of people tell about this crisis Lehman etc is that these firms levered up to a dangerous extent mm -hmm. uh, by 2006 or 2007 and what we're finding is is that you know you see this actually from data on their equity, from their bond spreads, from their CDS spreads, um, credit default swap spreads. Uh, the market's perception was that even though these firms were levering up, the underlying business risk was reducing so that their credit risk was actually going down. And uh, by the time we get to 2007, uh, the market is saying they're at a, at a level of financial safety that is almost a historical high. <laughs> so uh, it's exactly the opposite of uh, what we're now saying ex post. And then starting right in uh, August of 2007, you know, bad things begin to happen, just as we know from the news, we see it in the data. But uh, if you look at, if you compare large financial firms, particularly even the banks that failed or the ones of the stress test banks, and you go back to say 1962 to July of 2007, the financial soundness of these large financial firms tracks that of say the 50 largest non-financial firms. They're dead on each other. And it raises in our minds the question of, uh, are the sto stories that we tell about the impact of changes in financial regulation on financial firms' risk taking, are they actually there in the data? We're not finding that. That's interesting. Does your, um, does your theory uh, have anything to say about the desirability of, uh, let's say, uh, um, the Fed's emergency lending facility, whether it should be targeted, I guess, not necessarily to financial firms, but... Uh the, 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 the personal perspective, because I have two co-authors that I'm, <laughs> I'm taking away from this research, and, and partially because we live in California, I, I'm beginning to, to think of, try to think of financial regulation and the Fed's role uh, in the following context. In California, we face a risk, very unfrequent, that a large earthquake will occur. And uh, when that happens, we don't want all the buildings to fall down and kill everybody. So we put in building codes that in normal times look like they're very severe. And a builder might say, this is a very expensive for me to comply with these building codes for an event that's gonna come every 30, 40 years. Uh, but we go ahead with that because we know the event can be very bad. We're seeing these financial crises as being like earthquakes. Very, you can't really predict them. They come along, I mean, we have two in the Great Depression and one in 2008, so we had three in a century. Um, and when they come, I'll put it this way, all the buildings fall down. And so I kind of would maybe see the, the role of the Fed or the banking regulators as coming in and saying, can we design building codes that perhaps for banks that look excessive perhaps in normal times, but the, the stress test we want to put on the banks is an, a credit event that's similar to what happened in these three episodes. And that would be a perspective on regulation that I think will be different because bankers will complain mm -hmm. the same way I'm sure builders in California complain. And then, you know, but you have to say, well, but we're waiting for these very large unpredictable events uh, and so be curious how that goes when you if you were to embrace that view of regulation and try it out it's interesting that you use the analogy of earthquakes which I guess I would I would take to be acts of nature um, do you believe that this is just the way it is the way uh, that the uh, or or that these so-called earthquakes are somehow a byproduct of the underlying 
economic institutions? Or, uh, or are they just unavoidable consequences of people interacting with each other? I, I can't answer that. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I emphasize earthquakes is that I would say a lot of what I read about the thrust of financial regulation, even in the Dodd-Frank Act, takes the perspective that the regulators should try to foresee a crisis or a risk building up somewhere, take action in advance to deal with that risk. In, uh, when you deal with earthquakes and building codes, you accept that you, you're not going to foresee it. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen sometime, you don't know when, and, and so you don't invest a lot of resources in trying to predict a crisis. You invest your resources in figuring out if something happens, how can we design buildings that uh, don't fall down. So this is, I agree with you, it's a larger, at this stage perhaps, metaphysical question as to whether you know, it's an act of nature or it's something that could be dealt with, but I just meant in kind of a more practical way. So the example I would give is Canada's banks, if you look at them with this measure and other market measures, went through this crisis, much, they were much healthier than U.S. banks. And so you could ask, okay, what are the Canadians doing with regulation that we're not doing? And, you know, could we use some of their ideas to strengthen our banking system? So, I mean, I would say the takeaway, I mean, what we're taking away from this is that uh, mechanically what goes, what went on in 2008, what went on back in the Great Depression was what we call uh, uh, kind of an explosion of the market's perception of risk. And so if you're a banker or if you're someone regulating a bank, you should think in terms of uh, this earthquake analogy being uh, what will happen to me as a banker if all of my, you know, credits get downgraded by, you know, eight notches? And you think, how will my institution survive? That, that that is really kind of fundamentally what you're facing in a crisis as a banker, because you've lent to all these credit risks. And as a regulator, you can work with the banker to ask that question. And I think that's a very different uh, uh, stress test than what's currently being administered. Which is what? Just right now the stress test is you should think in terms of unemployment goes to 8% right. or GDP falls by a certain amount. Mm -hmm. They're not asking the question, you know, they're saying what's the implication of that for credit? Usually not much. In a crisis it's a very distinctive event. It's just every firm all of a sudden looks like a much riskier credit bet. And so you'd have to think about if you have a portfolio of loans, imagine the whole thing goes at once by, you know, in terms of becoming worse credit quality. What will happen to you in terms of your capital and liquidity position? Will you be able to handle that event? Well, very good, uh, Andy. Thank you very much for taking the time to share uh, with us the, uh, uh, the results of your research.